Rewa Dionenden is an epidemiologist and associate professor at the University of Ottawa. Professor, good to see you again. Thanks for taking time to speak with me. Always a pleasure. Thank Look, you. Look, let's start with the decision by Ontario and Alberta uh, to lower the age of eligibility for booster shots to get third vaccines into people more quickly. Uh, what do you think of that move? Well, first of all, the, there's a conflict here, a tension between the need to vaccinate the world and the desire to have optimal immunity for those of us who are already vaccinated in the rich countries. Both need to happen, frankly. And we're sitting on millions of doses here in Canada that aren't being shipped around the world. So I think, yeah, now is the time to be trying to optimize the immunity for those of us who've been vaccinated. That means lowering the age for those eligible for that booster shot. I think it will make a difference in terms of uh, population dynamics and transmission, and certainly for individual protection. And I want to come back to you. You've raised an important point on the on the global uh, vaccine issue, and we'll come back to that. But what do we know about the, the current vaccines and, and whether they're effective against the Omicron variant, whether a booster shot uh, will provide more protection? We don't know a lot. That's the bottom line. And that's not useful for anybody right now. I will say it's highly unlikely that the vaccines will have no effect. It's likely they'll have at least some effect and probably a significant effect. And we're hearing some rumors from Israel that they have some data showing that the Pfizer shot is quite effective against serious disease. That's good. A booster, what boosters do is they increase the antibody response, your immunogenic response. That's always a good thing. So it seems likely that a third booster, a third dose in the Prime series actually, will increase our resilience against Omicron. This is all predicated on having no data. This seems likely. Yeah, we are in this funny area, right? We're in this, uh, not funny necessarily, but we're in this 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 area where we uh, we don't know a whole lot about how this this uh, variant will perform and how serious uh, how serious uh, it may affect people. Um, should be we we'd be worried about that. The decisions taken now. Uh, how do we know they're the right decisions in the absence of the data? <laughs> Well, there is the precautionary principle that says in absence of complete data, if the threat is uh, serious enough, we overreact. And so we have to overreact right now, which means rolling out all the plans, all the, the levers to increase vaccination, rolling out all the tools we have to increase and optimize the immunity that exists, and reducing the likelihood of importing more cases of Omicron by doing border testing, and also ratcheting up our genomic surveillance so we get a handle on where this this variant is popping up in our community so we can suppress it when it happens. Mm. We're doing everything we need to do in absence of complete information. As more clarity comes forth, then it'll be clearer exactly which steps are needed more than others. I will add that we know now that COVID is airborne. That's been confirmed. And as a result, the mitigation tools we can use are extraordinarily different and potent, like ventilation and N95 mask usage. Those two things alone should curtail transmission substantially. You touched on it earlier. The conversation around the need for boosters uh, can't take place in isolation. There's the argument uh, that the world would be better served, Canada would be better served by sending uh, excess vaccines we have for boosters, perhaps to developing countries that need initial doses of vaccine to stop the spread. Uh, you touched on it. Uh, tell me more. Where do you come down on that? Well, here's the thing. Until most of the world is vaccinated, the unvaccinated, especially those in countries that cannot afford good quality masks and ventilation and distancing, will be variant farms. This is where the new variants will emerge. And new variants are the single most dangerous roadblock on our highway out of this mess. We, ha we have to take that off the table. And we do that by having as much population immunity built into the global population as possible. That means an enormous global effort to produce and distribute both vaccines and high quality respirator masks. And, and yet, uh, you know, so still there's the, there's the option. Should we booster Canadians, if I can put it that way, or should we say, look, okay. uh, we think we will have enough protection in the short term against the variant and we got to get these excess vaccines to, uh, to poorer countries? I'm going to give you an unhelpful answer. That is, we can do both. And it just takes political will and a decision to do so. We have the technology. We just need the will and the desire to invest the resources in doing both. Acquire more doses, um, encourage the world's manufacturing sector to produce more doses and more masks, and do both. All right. We also have uh, new testing rules from the United States announced today for all air travelers, including Canadians, who will now need a negative COVID test within 24 hours of their flight to the United States instead of uh, the rules now, which is 72 hours. Uh, what do you think of that measure? Yeah, uh, testing remains our best hope of curtailing this threat uh, at an international level until we understand it better. So it has to be done. Uh, I know it's inconvenient for many and expensive for many. And there may be other tools we can overlay, like empowering 
the pharmacies close to the airport with the appropriate tools to do rapid testing. Having more rapid PCR testing capacity available will be helpful. But I think this is a wise option in the short term until we fully know what's going on. Uh, very quickly to finish up here, we've uh, had Delta, we uh, have Omicron. Um, how often should we expect to see and have to react <laughs> to COVID-19 variants of concern? Um, variants are popping up all the time. Most of them don't make the news. Most don't even make the status of variants of interest. Those variants of interest, variants of concern, and variants of high consequence. Keep in mind, we have seen no variants of high consequence yet, which is a good thing. The, the highest we've seen is variants of, of concern. Mm. And so far, that means all the variants respond in some way to our treatments and vaccines. So mutations happen all the time. Uh, you can't predict when a concerning one will emerge, but they will continue to emerge so long as we let transmission happen, especially in crowded places with no vaccination. All right. It's always good to talk to you, uh, Ray Wadionandan. Uh, thanks for your time again tonight. Take care. Thank you.